Ladies and gentlemen, if everyone can come on in and grab their seats. My name is Tony Arend. I am Senior Associate Dean in the Walsh School of Foreign Service. And on behalf of the Walsh School and Georgetown University, I want to welcome everyone to our seventh annual International Cyber Engagement Conference. It's an honor to have all of you here, and we have a packed, filled day. Many of you know that the School of Foreign Service was founded in 1919. It was a very troubled time for the world. The First World War had just come to an end. A new international organization was being created, the League of Nations. And the United States found itself in a very different position of prominence in the international system. It was in that year, in this hall, on November 25th, that Edmund A. Walsh delivered an address. The address was entitled, The Aims of the School of Foreign Service. Father Walsh said, we train for law, we train for divinity, we train for medicine, but we don't train for foreign service. We don't properly prepare people for careers in this changing, uncertain world. And so his vision was to create here at Georgetown an academy to prepare people to go into this world. Fast forward to today, nearly a hundred years later, we see in the world new actors, new forces, we see a cyber realm that we are still trying to understand and analyze. This is exactly the place that Father Walsh would want us to be, to engage people from the private sector, the public sector, the nonprofit sector, to work together to try to understand the norms, the policy, the way forward in the cyber field. And so it's an honor to be here. I am certain that somewhere Father Walsh is looking down upon us and saying, I'm happy because this is where I want Georgetown to be. Well, our impresaria of this conference, as I think everyone knows, is Dr. Catherine Lotriante. Dr. Lotriante, as I noted, has been running this conference for seven years now and is bringing in the best people from all over the world. Dr. Lotriante is a professor here at Georgetown University. She did her PhD here at Georgetown and also her master's in our security studies program. She's had a distinguished career in the public sector, serving as an assistant general counsel to the Central Intelligence Agency and as counsel to the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Catherine Lotriante. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here for the seventh annual International Conference on Cyber Engagement. Today, you will hear from over 40 speakers from many countries, government officials, corporate representatives, and academic experts. On the stage and in the audience, there are over 40 different countries represented, dozens of multinational corporations, NGOs, and many subject matter experts. We are all here today to engage with each other on some of the most complex challenges related to cyberspace. Recognizing that the history, geography, and culture of each country and its citizens on our planet are unique, there are always some unifying elements deriving from our common humanity. One of them is the demand placed on the polities of this world, whether ancient empires or modern democracies, to devise ways of enabling them to survive and flourish in an anarchical and often threatening international order that oscillates between peace and war and is always changing. Today, the lines between peace and war are no longer as clearly defined as they once were. So also is it with the blurring lines between what is military versus civilian, strategic versus operational versus tactical. In our cyber era, where these lines have become blurred, it has required nations, companies, and people to rethink the old ways of doing things, the traditional rules that applied depending on what was happening. In a world that is globalized and interdependent, we must be able to continue to harness 
all of the possibilities and benefits of such a world, but also allow everyone and every nation to continue to prosper economically, develop fruitfully, and maintain security. Given all the interdependent variables that come into play in doing this, a grand strategy for peace and stability in the cyber era can never be exact or foreordained. It relies, rather, upon the constant and intelligent reassessment of the polity's ends and means. It relies upon wisdom and judgment. Indeed, we need to understand that wisdom and judgment are not created in isolation or in seclusion in some ivory tower. They are formed and refined by experience, by the study of historical events, and by constant interaction between the multiple actors, the representatives of governments, the leaders of industry, and the members of civil society. It is with this in mind that the idea for an annual conference on cyber engagement sprung some eight years ago. A unique conference that would bring together the global community, government officials, private sector representatives, academics, and civil society from around the globe to discuss some of the most challenging issues we all face in the cyber domain and seek to find common ground among different views for the common good of all mankind. And these challenges are diverse, for, from developing national cyber strategies that will effectively ensure a country's cybersecurity, negotiating international rules for state behavior in cyberspace under the auspices of the United Nations, to debating the implications for everyone's security with the explosion of the Internet of Things, or rethinking how we make investments in innovation and cybersecurity in order to better anticipate and harness the opportunities that exist. And still, there are difficult subjects that have yet to garner agreement, such as the appropriate and proportionate responses to hostile cyber activities, and the role of governments versus the private sector in those responses, the establishment of agreed upon standards for the attribution of such activities, and the evolution of asymmetric or nonlinear warfare involving cyber operations, and the role for international alliances and international organizations in countering aggressive state and non-state activities in the cyber domain. These are some of the issues that you will hear discussed today. On the topic of these issues, every nation has a say in how we ought to approach these challenges. Every individual and company can have an impact and a role to play in the solutions to these challenges. And old and new international organizations will be integral to the resolution of disputes within this domain. We all get a vote in how we will pave the path towards a peaceful and stable cyberspace. Made by man, cyberspace is a place of almost unlimited potential to improve humanity, but it is also incumbent upon all of us to work together to ensure that that potential is preserved and developed in a manner that allows nations, the private sector, and individuals to peacefully coexist. To be alive in the 21st century and to be a responsible global citizen is to understand the importance of these issues. Over the years since the start of this conference, many people have asked me, why at Georgetown University? Well, there are a number of reasons, reasons and if I may just mention a few. First, because I have dear friends here who are like family, people like Tony Aaron, who are willing to support just an idea from an average person about what could potentially be accomplished here at Georgetown by engaging others on cybersecurity challenges. Secondly, our university president, President Jack DeJoya, has said, the world's great universities have a special responsibility to address the global challenges that will shape humanity's future. I truly believe in this. I believe that this is our responsibility as a university, a place where differences of opinion can be voiced. And while there will not always be agreement reached or even acceptance of views, there will always be respect for the right of expression and opinion and the potential to forge new paths for consensus. And lastly, I believe Georgetown is truly unique in its identity, its strengths across academic disciplines, its presence in Washington, D.C. These characteristics, I think, are critical to developing the model of a global university in service to the wider world. And certainly, cyber issues are global challenges that call 
for global solutions. The ethos of this university is to seek the betterment of humankind, to discern what it means to be global, a global university in the service of the wider community, advancing peace, prosperity, and justice within and between the many global communities. Cyberspace has connected us all in ways unimagined in its initial, in its initial development. It is an honor to serve as a convening place for you all today. It is my wish that you all enjoy the day. I hope that you all, might all connect on these issues, debate the possibilities for resolution of some of the challenges, disagree not for the sake of disagreement, but to move forward in a positive manner, and most importantly, to continue to engage together wherever and whenever we next meet again. Before I introduce our opening keynote, I want to let you know that during today's event, we, you will be able to ask questions at the end of each session. If you would like to ask a question, please approach the microphone in the center of the aisle. Please announce your name and your organization and your question. And so that we may accommodate as many questions as possible, please only ask one question. Mr. Robert Joyce, he is our, we are fortunate to have him today as our opening keynote speaker for the conference today. He is the special assistant to the president and cybersecurity coordinator at the White House. There, he leads the development of cybersecurity strategy and policy for the United States. He previously served at the National Security Agency for more than 27 years. From 2013 to 2017, he served as a chief of tailored access operations, the NSA's mission element that provided tools and expertise in computer network exploitation to deliver foreign intelligence. Prior to becoming the chief of TAO, Mr. Joyce served as the deputy director of the Information Assurance Directorate at NSA, where he led efforts to harden, protect, and defend the nation's most critical national security systems and improve cybersecurity for this nation. Mr. Joyce, I would like to welcome you, and we hope you can all welcome you to the stage, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to hear your first public talk since you've taken over this role at the White House. Thank you very much, Mr. Joyce. Good morning, everybody. I'm excited to be here, but I will tell you I have a little bit of shame, so I have to confess. Um, my parents don't know I'm making this first talk at Georgetown. I grew up in Syracuse, New York, near Syracuse, New York, and Syracuse basketball in the mid-80s was a thing, a really big thing, and the Georgetown-Syracuse rivalry was huge, if any of you followed that. So I don't know when I break the news to my mother tonight that I, I came out and gave the first speech in this gorgeous Georgetown Hall, whether she will share the same excitement I do. We'll find out. Um, so this morning I'd like to talk about some of the administration's cybersecurity priorities. And, and I'll start by trying to get you to think a little bit about the challenges we face in the government. So I'll start in the government space. U.S. government has a massive investment in technology. Um, we rely on it in all parts of our mission, and we, uh, we, like the rest of society, have grown increasingly reliant on that dependence. Our government has something like 200 different departments and agencies, give or take, right? Uh, and, and in those departments and agencies, some are really well-resourced and focused on the problem. So take, for example, the Department of Defense, um, massive money and investment in those networks. And across the department, um, it houses things like national secrets. There's personal data from the employees and even some from the, uh, the people of the country. Um, computers can even control and guide the weapons systems uh, inside the Department of Defense. So while we have resources and capabilities in that places, there's always the opportunity to recruit some of the top minds in the countries to work on those interesting and challenging problems. The Department of Defense has a great base to draw on when they think about cybersecurity. So contrast that to some other parts of the country, or other parts of the government. So I don't want to pick on the Bureau of Reclamation 
but I want you to have a mental picture of the challenge. So I've got to give you an example, and I'll use the Bureau of Reclamation as that example. They manage, develop, and protect the water and related resources in our country. They are the second largest producer of hydropower in the United States, and they have 53 hydroelectric plants that over the past 10 years has produced 40 billion kilowatt hours of electricity. There's a lot of technology in that important critical infrastructure mission, right? So how do we ensure the Bureau of Reclamation has the same focus on cybersecurity in their critical infrastructure that the Department of Defense does in their weapons systems? That's a real challenge. It's hard to do cybersecurity right in an organization that's well-resourced and focused on the problem, let alone if your main focus is really not technology-oriented. We clearly don't have the same focus and resources across all 200 departments and agencies in the US, and that's a key challenge inside the government. What we really understand as security practitioners is that you're only as strong as your weakest link. So in the federal government IT space, if we have people who are at the head of the pack, they are challenged by the people who are at the back. So cybersecurity is an immediate and top priority for the Trump administration. At a campaign event back in Virginia, President Trump said, to truly make America safe, we truly have to make cybersecurity a major priority. So by being here, I know everyone in the room would agree with that emphasis. I'm here to tell you we're working hard on the direction and things are well underway. So the first major priority of the administration is to enhance the security and defenses of the federal government networks. As the president said, we operate these networks on behalf of the American people and this is a critical duty entrusted to us. When the famous or infamous OPM breach was discovered in June 2015, personal details of about 20 mil million people were compromised. Uh, those were people in the government. Not only were the government employees impacted, but so were the friends and relatives who were also listed on the security applications of those people as they applied to government. Uh, it, it just scares the heck out of me to think that our adversaries, through the penetration of one database, got that massive amount of information on people who hold security clearances in the U.S. government. So that's what we mean when we say we operate the networks on behalf of the American people. The failures impact real people and not just the people in the government as we saw by the families of those around them. Similarly, imagine what would happen if we had breaches in the Social Security Administration or the IRS. Um, what that would do to put our country or our people at risk. So because of that, we really have a changing mindset in the administration we are going to emphasize that cybersecurity leadership starts at the top. The president will hold the heads of departments and agencies accountable for managing the cyber risk of their enterprises. Cybersecurity really isn't just the domain of the IT department or even the chief information uh, security officer. Cybersecurity is the responsibility of those department heads, the cabinet sector secretaries, the agency directors. Uh, I had the opportunity recently to sit down with the CEOs of seven major companies who were, um, who were the leaders in a critical infrastructure sector. So those folks spent two hours with me talking about cybersecurity, where we're headed and what they're worried about. And they consider cybersecurity an existential threat to their companies and their industry. If they have a failure, they, they understand that their companies could cease to exist. And so they invest time. They not only spent two hours with me, they spent the whole day together with their competitors talking about cybersecurity as it pertains to their industry and what they could do to band together to improve it. They really, really get it. They put this emphasis from the top um, on making sure that they are not at risk, or at least they understand those risks and they drive them down to the best possible acceptable level. So in doing that, um, they not only spent those two hours with me, they spent the whole day, and that's on top of any time they spend in their normal work days inside their company, just managing their own, their, their own resources. So I'll ask you, how many people think our heads of departments and agencies make a similar investment in cybersecurity inside the government? 
How many other critical infrastructure leadership spend that kind of emphasis on cybersecurity? But really, that leadership from the top is what it's going to take to make sure that we're safe. So while we're emphasizing at the very most top of the leadership and organization that we've got to do cybersecurity right, we're also recognizing that risk decisions that the agencies make individually can impact not only that agency, but have implications across the whole of the government. As we were reminded by after the breach of OPM, those intrusions also compromised our national security. So data pulled out of OPM put CIA, FBI, and other places at risk. The idea that an adversary could go through and pull that data from a common, poorly defended repository and gather it in bulk simply isn't acceptable. A newer example of a cross-agency threat emerged at the end of March. A feature of the, student, the federal student loan program um, intended to speed the application process and reduce the administrative burden on the applicants was found to be exploitable. So when you go to do a student loan, you have to verify your income and your, your, uh, your basis of wealth. And so somebody came up with an awesome idea to have a tool that would automatically import data um, from, from the IRS. So as people were supplying authoritative data to be matched against IRS records, uh, the Department of Education site had an IRS data retrieval tool, and good government made this a streamlined function. But it, unfortunately, thieves found that they could pull IRS data through that Department of Education portal and use it, for, uh, use it for theft. So this vulnerability ended with a really good news story, early discovery, uh, contained impact, and there's an effort underway to bring that capability back online because we do want to make ease of use an emphasis area, but ease of use combined with security. So for these reasons, we're looking at adopting a comprehensive enterprise risk management approach for federal cybersecurity. We've never before looked at the whole of the federal government as one enterprise. We will, take, we will then be able to evaluate whether in the aggregate the federal government's risk posture is appropriately tailored to the threat environment we're facing. Work in this environment requires every department and agency to understand their systems. I really mean understand, right? Not, not have a, a, a network diagram of what they think they built, but understand the infrastructure and the architecture in detail. Those experienced in, in cybersecurity know we're never going to stop a motivated intruder. We need to ensure that we don't make it easy for them to get in, but well-constructed, well-thought-out, well-designed architectures limit compromise even when there's an exposure. We need to do a much better job of detecting when we're compromised and responding rapidly to that breach. It's unacceptable that somebody can rattle around inside our networks for weeks, months, or even years. That's a common occurrence today. It doesn't matter whether you're, you're in the commercial industry or the federal space, and that is something that needs to be addressed. Cybersecurity really is all about risk management. You can drive out every vulnerability we know today, and tomorrow another zero day will emerge, or, or hackers will find a new way, a new technique that we hadn't thought about um, that gives them a new exploitation vector. So our architectures must expect that we can't be perfect at keeping intruders out, and we now have to have methods to detect those breaches and limit the success after penetration. All of that really starts with understanding our networks. You can defend a network, you can't defend a network if you don't know how it's architected. You certainly can't defend it if you don't know the components that make up the network. And a single poorly chosen component can, can lead to that entry point and that breach. So the evaluation of our as-is is a very important necessary step on the journey to improve defenses and one that'll be an important success um, step on our way in improving the federal government as a managed enterprise activity. The individual understandings of departments and agencies that we, we will be kicking off will then feed our efforts to adopt a comprehensive enterprise risk management approach for federal cybersecurity. So as we look to reform 
Federal cybersecurity is one of the three major focus areas for the administration's cybersecurity efforts. The President believes we must move to shared services in future IT procurement decisions. A major effort is underway with the Office of American Innovation, developing approaches for the President's consideration to modernize federal IT systems, retire those old outdated systems, and move to shared services. I'm confident with the support of Congress and with the coordination of departments and agencies that will achieve cost efficiencies and significant operational improvements. And what that really means is good government benefits for the people. In addition to improved experiences with online government services, cybersecurity will see benefits of that revitalization as well. The refresh offers important opportunities to improve our cybersecurity posture because it's no secret there are outdated and indefensible IT components in the federal realm today. It's also true that commercial industry can offer us innovative digital services for government. So what we really need to do, we need to ensure that this innovation and cybersecurity are intertwined. You can have awesome innovation that doesn't consider the cybersecurity implications of what you're building, and you will reap the benefits of that innovation, but you'll also pay the price because of increased compromise and some of the heinous breaches that we've seen in the past. At the same time, it's really easy to make cybersecurity such an emphasis area <coughs> excuse me, that you build a system that is so secure that it's insecure. We've all seen things that are meant to provide security that don't get used simply because it doesn't work in our lives. It's inconvenient or, or even we're incapable of executing. So if you innovate without consideration for, for security at the start, then that too results in failure. I'm quite pleased to note that we're considering cybersecurity with innovation, that integrated component, and we'll bring forward improvements that will considerably enhance security and resilience while improving the government's digital services. So I mentioned the first priority was enhancing security and defenses of federal networks. The second priority for cybersecurity of the administration is to secure critical infrastructure. Most of this critical infrastructure is owned, operated, and secured by the private sector. So this means taking our partnerships with the private sector to a new level, deeper and more collaborative. We'll take a hard look at what additional capabilities we can support, we can use to support security and resilience. We'll provide market incentives. We'll listen and learn from the private sector, what the private sector has to say about how we can work together and defend the nation. We'll find effective ways critical infrastructure companies can request expert assistance from DHS, from those sector-specific agencies that are responsible for critical infrastructure, and other subject matter experts throughout the government. We'll find efficient ways to leverage the knowledge that the government has on advanced persistent threat and utilize those insights into defense of the critical infrastructure. These are key intelligence insights that only the government pr can provide, and we'll work to utilize those for defense of critical infrastructure, all the while keeping those sources and methods safe so we don't lose them the first time we operationalize them. So for critical infrastructure, it's not enough to just improve protections. We must improve resilience. When we do get hit, and make no, make no bones about it, at some point we are going to see critical infrastructure attacks. Uh, we have to contain that damage and be able to rapidly restore capabilities. A key part of resilience is having worked through contingency plans, whether it's for the military side, the civilian side, the critical infrastructure components, especially things like the ISPs and the electric grid. Through exercises, a well-understood way forward must be established for high-end contingencies, and we'll achieve this through an effective planning process supported by exercises and detailed playbooks. This type of planning is very routine. In other emergency scenarios, we do it for storms, fires, earthquakes, and even biological hazards. So it has to be a best practice for cybersecurity. In the critical infrastructure space, we're also putting focus on driving down the risks from distributed attacks, such as IoT botnets that threaten our communications infrastructure. As the recent Mirai botnet cyber attacks utilizing cameras, baby monitors, and other ordinary devices demonstrated, 
the Internet of Things connecting machines to computers and linking them through the Internet is already upon us. In the next decade, however, the Internet of Things will expand by orders of magnitude, just massive growth and expansion, connecting all manner of things, our cars, our health devices, buildings. It's going to be pervasive. While such connectivity comes with promises of better living standards, greater efficiencies, and lower costs, the recent attacks reveal that the Internet of Things potential to be exploited for further cybercrime, exploited by nation states, and other actors is simply unacceptable. We can and must find a way as a nation to dramatically reduce the number of significant botnet attacks, and we're already underway working with very smart people and innovative companies to do this, not because the government will direct them to, but because it's the right thing to do. Right? We envision a future where this is a necessity. So the third cybersecurity priority we have in the administration is out in our broader international space. We need to ensure that we have an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure global internet that benefits the United States and the rest of the world. The U.S. has championed the development and promotion of a framework for responsible state behavior in cyberspace, consisting of the affirmation that international law applies in cyberspace. It really goes without saying that cyberspace is not some magical entity that the, the, the international law doesn't apply to. So we have reaffirmed that norm that international law definitely applies in cyberspace. We've also worked to identify voluntary peacetime norms that go along with that. We're pressing ahead with implementation of practical confidence measures, confidence building measures between states to reduce the risks of misperception or escalation. There's danger in cyberspace, and we need to be sure that others understand our intent and our actions. But while the United States remains committed to stability in cyberspace, we cannot assume that all other nations support this objective. We're developing strategic options for deterring adversaries and reduce the risk to the American people from malicious state-sponsored activity. We will not allow other nations to hold us at risk through the use of cyber. We will not allow other nations to hold us at risk through the malicious use of cyber. This is an important value for us, and we will continue to propagate it. This clear deterrence strategy will, of course, include enhancing our defenses and resilience because we must be assured first that we can protect ourselves when we need to act. We must be able to sustain our infrastructures in the time of stress. Deterrence in cyber doesn't always come from, cy come from producing cyber responses themselves. The U United States has many avenues to respond to malicious activity, and often the response tool will be a traditional response from the whole of government. We recognize that deterrence also necessitates the development of flexible and immediate, sometimes reversible, responses tailored to key threats and malicious actors. We'll work with partners and allies who share our goal of a stable cyberspace, especially where there are incentives for cooperation and consequences for disruptive behavior. Finally, this international focus, for this international focus, we will reinvigorate existing and build new partnerships internationally that focus on cyberspace with partners that will advance our shared security and economic interests. The Internet has been a revolutionary driver of economic growth, development, prosperity, and we have a duty to protect and preserve its open, collect, uh, collaborative, and connected nature. The Internet is a global network, and to protect it, we'll work with a global coalition of governments, industry, and academia, and other stakeholders to safeguard and ensure its continued benefit to us all. This work includes capacity building to expand connectivity and raise capabilities of partner countries, law enforcement cooperation to combat cybercrime, and information sharing to address threats and providing assistance with incident response. So as the administration presses ahead on these three areas of uh, focus for cybersecurity, a key enabler will be the workforce development. It's no secret that there's a global shortage of highly skilled cybersecurity professionals and the people are the principal strategic capability that distinguishes one nation's cyber defenses from others. 
Our industry needs this talent just as the government needs this talent. So think back to my opening topic. If you're a top graph graduate from Carnegie Mellon, from Georgetown, MIT, or Stanford, with a computer science focus, would you be drawn to the clear cyber mission following the big investment into parts of the Department of Defense? Or would you apply to the Bureau of Reclamation to do cybersecurity? I think that answer is pretty clear from where we see the talent applying today. For these reasons, we really need to develop shared services and work on the federal IT as an intent, intentional architecture to leverage the best talents of government and industry across that whole of government. We can't afford to have has and have, haves and have nots that are going to impact our security. So to develop these talented individuals, we'll be looking broadly at our cyber education and training programs, exploring best practices from countries around the world, and finding the best methods to identify, develop, and retrain world-leading cybersecurity talent. So that really is a quick overview of the Trump administration's cybersecurity priorities. These focus areas were built knowing the information technology environment is really constantly and rapidly evolving. Think back to our world 10 years ago, right? The iPhone didn't exist. I expect most of you, maybe even all of you, have one even two or three of these devices with you right now. Right? That device connects you to the sum total of the knowledge of the human race. It gets you connected to your information no matter where it lives. It's, it gets you to your banking information. It gets you to your government information. It can even talk to the thermostat in your home. Right? We are on the, the, the leading edge of a massive amount of connectivity that is starting with this interconnectedness. This device can talk to major cloud service providers that can do big data analytics and give you assessments that were out of reach of the human population just a few years ago. And so with all that power and capability, the computer in your life brings huge benefit, but it's also in, in introducing risks that we don't understand today. And so we need to be prepared to address them. Path forward we're on with this technology is accelerating, and it's really going to take the work of the government, the private sector, and academia to solve it. It's simply awesome how transforming it is to our lives, and being successful in this area takes strategy and planning, and I applaud all of you for putting your time and energy, much like those CEOs I talked about earlier, into thinking about this topic area. Right? So I'll conclude there, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks. Thank you for your uh, for your comments. Um, you talked about innovation um, a number of a uh, number of times. Um, one of your government colleagues, uh, Jared Kushner, has been put in charge of a panel, um, a study group for innovation. So, just wondering, how are you thinking about trying to leverage uh, the activities that are going on elsewhere in the government to get that innovation effort to incorporate some of these? cybersecurity priorities and, you know, how are you thinking, you know, is there a synergy there between what you're trying to do and some of these other efforts that are underway? Thank you. Yep. Thanks for your question. Um, you're right, Jared Kushner, um, Chris Liddell, Reed Cordish are working on um, the Office of American Innovation efforts to reform federal IT. Um, and I'm pleased to be a part of that. So I get to participate in, my staff gets to participate in those meetings because of that emphasis area as we reform and bring innovation from industry in the way government provides services, leverages cloud providers, gets into apps and connects data across multiple departments and agencies. Um, that means a refresh. That also means an opportunity to wire in from the ground up cybersecurity. And so our, our intention and our efforts underway are to, to evaluate at the beginning how we put the necessary cybersecurity hooks into it so it is a benefit, not a liability. Great question. Thanks. Uh, morning. Rick Weber with Insight Cybersecurity. Can you talk a little bit about the timeline and the content of the upcoming executive order? 
Um, the comprehensive risk management approach that you described, is that going to be spelled out in the executive order? Yes. So um, I'm happy to talk about the efforts, and I think you will find that uh, the administration priorities are well reflected in the work that's going into the executive order. Um, I, I will hesitate to comment on the timing. Um, it is close and nearby, but I can't give you an exact rollout. I think the important uh, focus on this is we want to make sure that the cybersecurity EO emerges with the time and attention it needs on that important topic, and at the same time is sequenced with other things that the administration is rolling out so we don't distract from other important messages that are out there. But we are very close, and what I think you will find is the, the activities I talked about here um, are the priorities of the administration and the kind of things you will see rolled out um, in, in any kind of direction that the government is giving. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Sorin Dukaru, Assistant Secretary General at NATO for Emerging Challenges, Cyber among them. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the broad outlay and you, you very much um, highlighted the, the interest to leverage the partnerships that the U.S. has uh, uh, with um, trusted uh, nations across the globe to, to increase um, uh, cybersecurity. And my question is, uh, how do you think uh, you could leverage uh, the uh, North Atlantic uh, Alliance uh, uh, as uh, an enabler uh, in this uh, sense, uh, especially since from the perspective of the recent meeting between uh, President Trump and Secretary General uh, Ian Stoltenberg, uh, the, the, the role of NATO as a bedrock of transatlantic security, and I think cybersecurity is part of it, uh, has been emphasized. Great question. So I agree with you that, um, that cybersecurity is a, has to be a fundamental emphasis of NATO. Um, as we look to the internet, it is a global commons, and we exist there. Um, with both our partners and allies, as well as those who are not as supportive of our, of, of our goals um, in international diplomacy. And so what we see is we need those partners and allies to bring strength. And I think um, there's been some outstanding leadership in, um, in NATO countries, um, often disproportionate to their size, right? You look at the Baltic states, and, and what they're doing in terms of cybersecurity. They also often are important partners because they show us threats and, and things that are emerging that they're having to deal with before we actually see it ourselves. Um, so I think you will find us leaning hard into the international partnerships, NATO amongst them, because we have such a good group of like-minded allies with a common purpose and a common dir direction. Thank you. All right, last question. I apologize for time. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you reaffirmed the applicability of international law to cyberspace, and you also mentioned uh, deterrence through non-cyberspace means. I'm wondering if, uh, in your opinion, deterrence through non-cyberspace means uh, will always fall below use of force thresholds, since the majority of cyber attacks up to this point have also fallen below that international law threshold. So I would expect um, you know, us continue to use the whole of government in terms of responses to cyber threats and cyber attacks. Um, that whole of government response includes things like the dip standard diplomatic channels we have. It includes criminal um, outcomes. It includes uh, the, the financial sanctions that we have applied. But it also could certainly include a military response to a cyber event, yes. Appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you very much.